Thank you, thank you. Welcome to Crossroads. Thank you for being with us today. Please worship with us. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Let us worship our King. 
Are you still believing him? They say this mountain can be moved. They say these chains will never break. But they don't know you like we do. There is power in your name. We heard that there is no way through. But we know.
this room, we have some mountains in our lives, and we've told ourselves that God used to do miracles. But I'm here to tell you that our God does miracles in the Bible days. He does miracles today, and he will continue to do them forever. So I want you to take those mountains that are in your life, and I need you to believe that God is going to do amazing things. God of miracles. God, that we will see the things. Lord, I pray that you give us the faith of a mustard seed. Lord, that those mountains would be moved and you would be able to use us mightily. God, we believe in your power, in your presence. You are worthy of all our praises. God, continue to come into this place and speak to our hearts this morning. Be the miracle doer and the way maker, Lord. We worship you and we honor you. In your name we pray, amen, amen. Let's give him a shout of praise. He is worthy of it all, amen. Amen, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. You may be seated. My name is Tony, and this is my story. Uh, my mother was a drug addict, and my father was an interesting fellow. Um, by the time I was eight years old, my parents' addiction was so bad that my brother and I entered foster care. We were living in an abandoned building with no running water, no electricity, and we would spend our days scavenging for food. When I entered into foster care, that's when I first encountered Jesus and went to church all the time. I knew of God, but I didn't know God. And so as a teenager, I still walked away and stopped going to church. Because of all the trauma that I experienced in my life, I lived a life of pure depression and severe anxiety and with complex PTSD. And I treated people uh, based off of how I felt because of that. When I was 32, my mother died completely unexpectedly. Um, she was incredibly young. And with her death, as surprising as it was, it showed me how much I loved her. Um, because we had such a tumultuous relationship, I spent the majority of my life actually not liking her. And so when she died, it completely threw me for a loop and I lost myself. Uh, I fell into really bad PTSD and I was in the darkest place that I have ever been in my life. One night, I just didn't know what to do, so I called out to God and he answered. I met my husband like a couple months later. It really wasn't long. Um, and he actually introduced me and my best friend to Crossroads. When we came to Crossroads, it wasn't even a conversation. We just knew like, this is our place. So during COVID, uh, things actually took a drastic turn. I was triggered and so 
as much as I wanted to isolate, my spirit kept telling me to, uh, to serve. I did not want to listen. No part of me wanted to serve. However, I obeyed and I started serving and it was the best thing that I could have ever done. Um, serving showed me just how important community really is. My life is drastically different now that I have Christ in my life. At the end of the day, I know that God is with me and I know that God will see me through because he promised that he would be there. My name is Tony. Jesus changed my life and I will never be the same. Well, good morning, Crossroads family. It's good to be here with you. I want to welcome everybody who's joining us out in East Windsor. It's great to have you here with us as well. If you're new to Crossroads, uh, at, at either one of our campuses, let me just tell you, that story that you just heard is, is what we are really all about. Uh, we are about pointing people to Jesus Christ. And we believe that as, as people find Jesus, that, that he changes our eternities Amen. and he changes our life here in, and now. And so, you know, what, what an awesome story that's there, that's, that's everything we're about, pointing people to Jesus. Say Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus. amen, amen. Hey, listen, we're um, doing a little bit different, uh, some things a little bit different with our, our service time here today. Uh, here in East Hartford, you'll notice that in East Windsor, uh, normally Pastor Stephen, who's out there with you, would be talking to you right now. But we wanna take just a couple of moments and address um, some, of the, some of the things happening uh, in, in our nation within the last 24 hours. I know a, a lot of individuals uh, are saying, um, hey, there's, there's questions in our hearts and our minds and we want to understand you know, what, what God would say to us in those kinds of times. And so I wanted to take a, a moment or two and address it. And I'm, I'm referring to the attempted assassination uh, last night that I'm assuming most people are aware of. So l- let me just say this, it was really... Um, Really a, a great thing for me, a great, that sounds weird in the middle of what we're talking about, right? Uh, but, but after hearing of the events that happened uh, last night, I, I started reaching out to a couple of the leaders in our church to you know, just try to understand how, how people are doing, how people are processing things. And what was a great thing to me was to, to see leaders in our church in their response to me, uh, sending me scripture verses. And I, I, I got so excited about that because that, that is who and what we should be. When, when we go through challenging times, where do you go? Turn back to the word of God. It, it is the foundation. It is, it is our source. It is, it is the place uh, to turn to. And so in a time like this, if you're asking the question, what do we do? What do we think? How do we feel? How do we process? What do we tell others? Let me give you just a couple of verses of scripture uh, from a couple of different spots. Uh, where God's word tells us how we ought to uh, how we ought to respond in these times. The first one's in the book of Romans, chapter twelve, and I'd encourage you to go and read uh, verses nine through twenty one uh, there on your own. I'm just going to read the last uh, verse out of that. But here's what the apostle Paul says. Um, he says this: In times like this, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And what we experience, what we witness, what we've heard about is truly acts of evil. The Bible tells us that we do not war against flesh and blood. It feels like it's against flesh and blood from time to time. But the truth is that our enemy, our enemy is at work. It's a spiritual battle. And our enemy is at work in everything, in every way, through things we say, through how we position ourselves, through events like this. Our enemy is at work trying to divide us trying to set our, us against one another, trying to keep us uh, fearful. Paul says, do not, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Well, how do we overcome evil with good? What, what's the practical implication of that? Well, Paul says in Ephesians chapter two, verse number 10, he says it this way. He says, well, here's how you do that. We are Christ's workmanship created for good works. And so in the middle of times like this, when, when the, if we know that the enemy is at work trying to divide us, uh, trying to separate us, trying to put fear into our lives, we have to ask the question, who has God made us to be? And how can we be about uh, uh, using who God has made us to be to bring peace and to bring unity back in? How do we practically do that? And there's a lot that goes into that, right? 
Let me read you one more passage where, where Paul kind of speaks to how that all begins, the beginning place for that. Paul is writing uh, to his apprentice, Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 1, he says this. First of all, what do we do first? First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Say all people. Then he gets a little specific. He says, for kings and for all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Here's here's the foundational principle from Scripture. You want to know how we get back to a place of peace and unity and love? It only comes through Jesus Christ. It only comes by taking the gospel and bringing it to the nations and, and having people's lives changed in Jesus. That, that's, God says, I, I desire that all men would, would do that. And that, that is what, that's, what, that's the good works that brings about real change. Why? Verse five, he says, for there is one God... And there's one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. And then verse number eight, he concludes with this. I desire then that every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. And so I want to ask us to do that today. I know we were just standing in worship for a moment ago, but here in East Hartford and in East Windsor, I want to ask you all if you would join me in standing right now. And we're going to go to God in prayer. I'm going to pray and I want to ask you to, to, to agree with me and join with me as, as we call out to God. God in heaven, first, first of all, I want to pause, God, and I want to thank you for who you are. I just want to, I want to, I want to, I want to take a moment and, and, and say that we recognize you, that you are God. And everything is in your hands. There's nothing in this life that can come through which you cannot lead us. You are our God, we are your people, and we we are so thankful that you have created us and that you sustain everything that's going on in this world. And so we give you praise for who you are first and foremost today. And in the midst of everything that's going, as, as we follow what your word tells us, Lord, we pray. We pray for those who are in leadership today. Father, we pray for former President Trump. We pray for the families of those who were killed and injured. We pray for all all that are traumatized by the events and for for the fear uh, that, that many are experiencing, for the confusion that is there, Lord. We pray that your Holy Spirit would touch people's lives today in very real ways. And at the focus of everything, Lord, we pray that events like this that, that just cause a commotion, Lord, that you would somehow use them to point people to their need for you. In seeing that there is a lack of peace, help them to understand that there's only one place for true peace. Draw them to you, God, in ways that only you can. And while you are drawing them, help us Help us to be the church that you've made us to be. Help us in times where you're drawing others to be ready to share your good news with people. That people would come to know you. And in that, we would find the unity that can only be found in you, in your love, and in your grace. And in everything, we give you praise. And God's people said... Amen and amen. I don't thank you for praying with me. You can go ahead and be seated. Um, we're we're going to, listen, this is going to feel like a little bit of a different service. In order to make some time for that, we've taken a couple of other things out, and it's going to feel odd, and you're going to ask, is this kind of how we're going to do things in the future? And I'm going to say, no, it's not, all right? This won't be normal. You'll feel odd here for a minute, and it'll be all right. Again, I want to tell you, if you're a guest who's here with us here at East Hartford or in East Windsor, at the conclusion of our service, there's a spot in both of our atriums where you can go. It's called Connection Point. 
Uh, you can meet with one of our pastors that's there. You can meet with one of our leaders. They'd love to get to know you a little bit uh, and, 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 uh, and, and serve you in any way that we can. It's great to have you here with us. And everything that we do, we're trying to point people to Jesus Christ. That's what our church is all about. So it's great having you here as we do that. Uh, listen, as a, part of, as a part of every one of our worship times, there's several things that are going on where people are worshiping God. One is uh, we come in and we start our worship times with, with songs, right, with, with praise. And we've done that. We've stunned and we, we sing praises to God. All around this building right now, there are people who are serving uh, and, and so in our children's area, uh, in, in our, out in our parking lot, out in the atrium, uh, in, the, in the sanctuary here, there's, uh, there's people all over that are serving the body of Christ, and that's an act of worship to God. In just a couple of moments, we're going to open the Word of God, and we're going to hear from God's Word, and, and, and we're going to work to allow God's Word to transform our lives, and that's a form of worship. Uh, one more one more type of worship that we do every week is we bring the Lord's tithes and our offerings. And we say in our giving that in everything in our lives, God, you are first, you are, you are foremost. And so uh, even with our finances, the thing that we hold the tightest, right, we're, we're going to put you first in that. So we're going to have a time of giving and worship right now. Our ushers are going to come down to the front. They're going to be ready to receive the Lord's tithes and our offering while they're coming one more time. Father God, in, in everything that we do this day, we lift your name and we worship you. Right now, we bring you your tithe and our offerings. And our prayer is that you would multiply these gifts and that you would use them to build your kingdom and to send your word around this world. And as we give today, we give you praise. Amen and amen. Normally at this time, we'd have the, the, the worship team that's singing another song, but we're, we're going to keep moving because... Um, you know, the preacher preached a long time and we just don't have time to, to make everything go. So if you have your Bibles with you today, take them and open to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 10. We're going to continue in our discussion of the book of Acts. And some of you don't listen to me at times when I say that. Today, please listen to me. I'm going to begin this message by reading a longer passage of scripture than we normally read many different verses, and, and you'll enjoy it more if you read along with me in your, in your own Bible. If you don't have a Bible today, if, if, you, if, if you're someone who doesn't have a Bible and you say, I can't afford a Bible, go to the connection point either here in East Hartford or in East Windsor uh, at the end of the service. Uh, talk to one of the leaders that's there and tell them, Pastor Sean said you would get me a Bible. We'll get you a Bible. We want everybody to have a Bible one way or another, all right? So we're going to read a story here that begins the book of Acts, and then afterwards I'll talk to you a little bit about some things that I think we can pull out of it. But while I'm reading this story, it's a lengthy passion, uh, I want you to help me out by engaging your imagination. Say, engage my imagination. So we're going to talk about some people in here and some circumstances, and I want you to try to, in your mind, the best you can, figure out what you think these people look like, all right? What, what, what it's looking like when it's happening. The story will be much better if you do that. And then we're going to come back and tie uh, all, all the pieces together. Does that make sense? All right. Acts chapter 10, verse number one. At Caesarea, Caesarea is a city in Israel that's on the water. Um, it, it's a key city. It's a, it's a city that's controlled by Rome. Uh, it, it's a key military city for them at the time of this story. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius. Say Cornelius. Can you picture what Cornelius looks like? Just make it up, all right? Your Cornelius is going to be different than my Cornelius. My Cornelius' hair is gray because I see him being older, but maybe yours isn't. I don't know. Cornelius was a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. It says, says he was a devout man and he feared God. That doesn't mean that he was a God follower. Um, he, was, uh, he wasn't a Jew. He wasn't a converted Jew. He was somebody that was just kind of trying to honor God in the ways that he could. And he would give money to help people who were in need. And he would pray to God and do things like that. But in today's world, you know, he's somebody who thought he was good, but didn't really, wasn't really, you know, he was, he, he just was trying to figure things out. Does that make sense? Verse number three, about the ninth hour of the day, which would have been three o'clock in our time, 
Uh, and, and it was one of the three main times that people went to pray. They would pray at nine o'clock in the morning. They'd pray about noon. They'd pray about three o'clock, which was the ninth hour of the day. About the ninth hour of the day, Cornelius saw clearly in a vision. So he was probably praying because he, he regularly prayed. And while he was praying, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And Cornelius stared at the angel in terror. Can you see the look on his face? And said, hey, what is it, Lord? What did I do? <laughs> you know, when authority comes in, a lot of times that's kind of where we're at, right? What did I do? What, what did I do wrong, right? It's funny, every time I ask somebody to come and meet with me, they always think they have done something. I'm like, I'm a loving guy. What have I done here, you know? It's okay, just come and meet with me. It's good things. What is it? What is it, Lord? And, and the angel said to him, verse number four, well, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Basically, the angel says, Cornelius, God, God's paying attention. He sees what you're trying to do. He sees you're trying to do what's right. He sees that you're, 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 you know, you're trying to pray, you're trying to give, you're trying to do these things, but he also knows he doesn't have a relationship with you. And so God's about to do something with you, Cornelius, because, because he sees what's going on. Verse number five, the angel says, what I want you to do is I want you to send some of your men down to Joppa and bring this guy called Simon, who is actually, his name is, is Peter. They call him Simon, his name is Peter. Verse number six. He's lodging or he's staling with a different Simon who's a tanner uh, whose house is by the sea at, at, at Joppa. He's, he's at, so Simon is at Simon's house or Peter is at Simon's house. Does that make sense? Verse number seven. When the angel that spoke to him left, he called, uh, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who, had, who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent these three guys off to Joppa to get Peter to come back with him. Verse number nine. The next day, long journey, the next day, as those guys, those three guys were on their journey and approaching the city of Joppa, Peter, who was in Joppa, went up on his housetop about the sixth hour, which would have been noon, our time, uh, to pray himself, because that was an hour of prayer. Verse number 10, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. How many of you can identify with that? And, and, and I don't know about you, but it's kind of funny. It's like anytime I go to pray, it's like I get hungry. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what that is. That has absolutely nothing to do with the story and what we're trying to tell. I'm just, I don't know, whatever. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing the food for him, Peter fell into a trance. Verse 11. And he saw the heavens, it's like the heavens opened up, and something like a great sheet descended or came down, being let down by its four corners on the earth. It's like, it's like there were ropes on the four corners of a sheet, and it was being let down from the heavens. Verse 12, in this sheet were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to Peter that said, rise, Peter, kill and eat, which you'd normally think, okay, I'm hungry. This sounds like a good idea, right? Verse 14, but Peter said, whoa, hey, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time. Peter, what God has made clean, do not call common or unclean. This happened three times and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had, had seen might mean. So he's, he's confused about this. Some of us are confused about this. Peter's confused about this. While he was confused about it, behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius having made inquiry about Simon's house, were there standing at the gate. Verse 18. And they called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. Hey guys, is Simon here? The guy, not, not the Simon whose house this is. Sorry, is Peter here? Is he home? I, I don't think they had a ring doorbell yet, but you get the idea, right? Verse 19. And while Peter was pondering the vision, Peter's still pondering the vision, the Spirit said to Peter, behold, Three men are looking for you. So it's kind of like the spirit was acting like a ring doorbell in that situation. I don't know. 
Verse 20, rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation because I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, guys, I'm, I'm the one you're looking for. What's the reason for your coming? What, why are you here? Verse 22, they said to him, well, this guy named Cornelius, who's a centurion, he's, he's, he's an upright God-fearing man. You know, he, he generally feels God. Uh, he, he's well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation. He's a good guy. I know he's a centurion, but he's, he's a good guy, right? He was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house so that he can hear what you have to say. Verse 23. So Peter invited them to be his guests overnight because it was going to be a long journey, right? The next day, Peter rose and he went away with them and he took some of his brothers from Joppa who accompanied them. So Peter didn't just go by himself, took a couple of his friends with him, verse 24. And on the following day, they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. So it wasn't just Cornelius. Cornelius apparently has a friends and family plan, and he texted everybody and said, guys, come on over to my house. Something's about to happen. I don't know what it is. An angel told me to do this, but something cool is going to happen. You want to be here when all this happens too, right? Verse 25. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. But Peter lifted him up saying, Bud, stand up. I, I'm, I'm just a normal man too. I'm just like you, all right? Verse 27. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. So he was expecting to see Cornelius, but Cornelius has this big group here uh, as well. And so Peter says to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. That was against the Jewish stands of the thing. They were, they were separating themselves from these pagan people so they wouldn't become like them, all right? But God, God has shown me that I should not call any person here common or clean. You see, Peter has now started to take on, uh, here's this vision that God has shown me, and he did it with food, but God's really talking about people here, and he's starting to get it. He didn't get it right away, but he's starting to get it now. Verse 29, so when I, when I was sent for, I came without objection, I, 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 and I asked then, guys, why did you send for me? Verse 30, Cornelius goes on and says, well, here's what happened. Over the next couple of verses, he says, an angel came to me. He told me, God's heard my prayers and all this. Send for Peter. Have Peter come. Down to verse 33. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God. Why? To hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. All right? there, there's the basic story. There's a little bit more that's there, and I'd encourage you to go back and read the more uh, later, and I'll summarize it here in, in just a couple of minutes. But here's the big idea that I want to give you today. You ready? God is calling unwanted and unworthy people to himself. Can, can you hear what I'm saying? God is calling unworthy and unwanted people to himself. And for some of you today, that's the only thing you need to hear today because when you walked in, you, you, no, nobody else would see this, nobody else knows this, but inside... What you are feeling today is that you are unworthy or unwanted. That's not the truth. God is calling people who, 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 who we feel like at times, who they feel like at times, they're unworthy and unwanted. Uh, the Bible says that God so loved the world that he sent his son. God is calling unworthy sometimes unwanted people to himself, using his followers to spread the news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And just like God did that here in this story today, he now, God now uses his followers to spread that same gospel message to call people that our world and sometimes even the church today might disregard to call the unwanted, 
to call the seemingly unworthy, to call the outsiders to himself. I want to show you just a couple of things from this passage. If you're taking notes today, there's three, three things I want you to consider, three points that I want you to see in this story. Here, here's point number one from the passage. It says this. God is working in ways that we cannot see to draw people to himself. The principle behind that is there are people in our lives that when we look at them, we think of them somehow as less than. We think of them as far away from God. We think of them as people who will never come to God. There's, there's no way that they will ever uh, seek God in their life. There's no way that it'll happen. You have people like that in your life. Some of you have family members like that in your life. Some of you have coworkers like that in your life. Some of you have neighbors like that in your life. Think about that person for a minute in context of what I just said. God is working in ways that we cannot see to draw those people to himself. Our story here begins with Cornelius, a a centurion who is a God-fearer. Cornelius is in a Roman outpost, which is a sign of um, power and oppression. He's, He's there and God sends an angel to meet with him. What we learn from the get-go here is that God is is not simply after likely candidates for the gospel. That's not how God operates. God goes after the outsiders. God goes after the unwanted. God even goes after the enemies to reach them. Here's Cornelius, who is certainly a mixed bag. He's not all good, not all bad, but he's still an outsider to the Jews. He's not even a converted Jew. At best, the the Bible says he he at least fears God in some ways. But he's still a centurion. He's still a Roman soldier and he oversees other Roman soldiers. He is still a reminder to every Jew about Rome's oppression, Rome's power, that the enemy is still in charge of us. that's That's who Cornelius is. I want you to notice this, though. Before Peter is ever called Uh, by God to to think about Cornelius. Before Peter is even aware that God is doing something, God sends an angel as a messenger to Cornelius. Here's what I'm trying to say. You and I are not always in the inner circle. We don't always get to know what God is up to. And God is up to things in people's lives that we don't know about. And if we were to ask the people who we see as far away from him, they would deny it was even happening because they're struggling with it and they don't even want you to know. God is involved in the lives of people around you in ways you don't see today. I've told this story before, but I think it bears repeating because to me it it just illustrates this so well. Um, Some years ago, I had a friend whose name was Dan. I met Dan in the construction world. He was doing some work for me at my house and Dan was very far from God. Dan would tell you he was very far from God. In fact, he told me, you know, I don't, I don't want anything to do with God. I, I spent, I, I developed a relationship with Dan over time. Uh, you know, we, we, we did some things, had some fun together. And, and for, for like three years of time, I, I spent time trying to find ways to talk to Dan about Jesus. How, how many of you have friends, though, that when, when, you, when you talk about some things, they're, they're really good at shutting you down? It's, it's like... Talk to the hand, right? That was Dan. I would try to find ways to talk to, to Dan about Jesus. Dan didn't want to hear it. I would try to find ways to invite Dan to come to church so he could hear about God and experience what it's like to be a part of, uh, of loving people. Who, who Dan had, didn't want anything. He didn't want to hear about it. Didn't want me talking about it. He had no problem telling me, I, I, don't, I, I don't want to hear about it. Don't ask me anymore. Don't, you know. Dan had no problem with any of that, right? So after, after knowing from him for about three years, Um, one day he was over and he was helping me with something. He was helping me with a sidewalk thing that I was doing at at the house. And I was working alongside him during the day. And all of a sudden in the middle of our talking, he says, he says, Sean, he says, um, I thought I'd tell you, I'm I'm probably going to come to your church on Sunday. (laughs) Really, Dan? Uh, Why is that? He said, well, it's kind of a long story. I said, well, I'm I'm interested in long stories. Go ahead, you know, tell me, tell me what it is. He says, well, he says, I've been dating this girl for some time. And um, he said, um, 
she's going to your church this Sunday and she asked me to go with her. <laughs> she, oh, okay. Interesting. She says, but I'm kind of upset with her. She said, you're upset with her. Why, why, why are you upset with her, Dan? And you're upset with her, but you're going to go to church with her. I, I'm not, not really understanding. Could you help me understand? He says, well, he says, it, it, it appears that um, she goes to a hairdresser regularly. You know, every couple months she goes to the hairdresser, gets her hair done, as ladies tend to do. Um, says, and apparently the hairdresser that she goes to goes to your church. <laughs> oh, okay. He says, and apparently the hairdresser who goes to your church talks to her about God and talks to her about her church and how it helps her and helps her in following God and all this stuff. And, um, and so her hairdresser, as a part of it, has been asking her to come to church with her and she's decided that she's gonna go. And so she came and told me she's gonna go and asked me to go, but I'm upset with her. And I said, Dan, why are you upset with her? He says, I'm upset with her because for the last year, I've, tried, I've been trying to get her to go with me. Dan, I am really confused here. What? I don't understand what you're saying. What do you say? He says, well, for the last year, I've been trying to get her to go to church with me. She said no every time, and now she's with her hairdresser, her hairdresser asked her to go, and I'm upset because she's going to go to church because her hairdresser asked her to go, but she wouldn't go when I asked her to go. And I said, Dan, I've been trying to get you to go for three years. And you shut me down. Don't want to talk about anything. Can you understand what I'm saying? Here's what I'm saying. You, you and I are not always in the inner circle. We don't know what we don't know. Only God knows. We don't always get to know what God is up to. And the truth is, the people in our lives who we think are far from God, who we think will never come to know God, can I just tell you, they would never let you know that God's at work in their lives doing some things. They, they don't want to tell you because they're working, struggling with that. They don't, they don't want to uncover that because they're already struggling with it. They don't, they don't want to share. We don't know what God is up to, but we don't have to come up with a plan to get the Spirit of God involved in what's happening in their lives. We just need to become aware of the fact that God is already at work in some way, in a way that we don't see. He's already doing something. And we just need to join in on what he's already at work in. Here's what I'm saying. Th think about the people in your life right now who are far away from God. Maybe people who you think would never come to know God. God is right now, right now, working in ways that you cannot see to draw men and women to him, even right now. He's at work in the lives of people who we know, who it feels like they are outsiders. The second thing, if you're taking notes today, the second thing that I'd like for us all to see is that God is calling us to take the message of the gospel. God is calling us to take the message of the gospel, even to those who we today see as outsiders. If you look, look at verse number nine of the story, Peter's up on the, on the roof and he's waiting for lunch and he's praying. But while he's praying, he sees some things. He sees this sheet that kind of drops down from heaven. It has all kinds of animals in it, birds, reptiles, all these kinds of things. And, and he hears this voice that, that presumably is Jesus talking to him that says, Peter, uh, get up, kill, and eat. And Peter's like, ah, I can't. The animals that are on there, they're, you know, I have these rules that we follow. I can't do that. I would, you know, I would never defile myself by eating things in that way. Uh, you know, and, and the voice says, well, don't call, don't call clean what I've made clean. And, 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 and if you're confused about what this means, it's okay. Peter's confused too. Verse 17, it says, while Peter was inwardly perplexed, he's, he's trying to understand what's going on. He's thinking, listen, I'm hungry here. 
there's all these animals that, that, that by the Jewish laws, we're not allowed to eat them. Am I supposed to break Jewish food laws? Or what, what does this all mean, right? And while he's thinking that, these guys show up at his door that, that, that end up being guys that, that Jewish people aren't supposed to spend time with because they're not viewed as being clean. They're viewed as being people that would lead them in another way. And, and, and so Peter's trying to put all this together and eventually figures out that one, one thing equals, equals the other, right? But, but just to help us get to an understanding of what we're saying, maybe you're today confused a little bit by, by Jewish food laws. And, and, and that, I get it. If you're confused by that, I, I get it. That makes, under, uh, makes sense. Let me explain that and then we'll, we'll tie the two together here, right? We can re- read about how the Jews had food laws and think, you know, those laws kind of seem, um, they, they seem a little mean, a little unfair. It, it kind of feels like, you know, you go to a nice restaurant and they hand you the, the child's menu. You can only order off the child's menu. Like you're telling me I can eat some food, not eat other foods. I don't know. That just kind of seems mean because I like to eat the foods that I like to eat in stuff. And, and there's a bunch of them there, but, but not having pork, I don't know. I mean, you get a good glazed pork belly and, and how do you say no to that? I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how that all goes, right? Um, sorry, I just made some of you hungry. For, uh, forgive me. Well, here's the point. Let me explain to you the point of the food laws and then we'll, we'll see a connection here, all right? If you go back to Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 11, Leviticus chapter 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, in there, uh, God is giving to his people a whole bunch of things that he's going to say, I don't want you to do. They're about to go into the promised land, into a land of pagans, where people, people are, are doing all these pagan practices, pagan worship. They're using different foods as a part of those things. They're, they're living their lifestyles in certain ways. And God is saying, You're, I'm about to send you into a land and I'm kicking these people out of the land because they're living pagan lives. And I don't want you to go into the land and be like them. Make sense? So he says, verse, uh, chapter 11, or uh, verse number one, he says, and the Lord spoke to Moses, Aaron, saying to them, speak to the people of Israel, saying, uh, and, and here he's gonna talk about food laws, and the next chapters he's gonna talk about other things, but so speak to the people of Israel, saying, there are living things that you, may, that, you, that you may eat among all the animals of the earth, and then there are not, all right? And I'm not gonna read through the detail of the verses, but verse number four says, you shall not eat the camel, there's some reasons the camel is unclean to you. And you go, well, I don't really want to eat a camel. Anyways, that sounds weird, right? Well, it does in our culture, but in that culture, you know, different. Verse number five, and don't eat the rock badger. The rock badger is unclean to you. Don't eat rock badgers. All right, I don't even know what a rock badger is. Is it tasty? I don't know. Verse number six, this kind of pulls us back in. And don't eat the hair. It's unclean to you. It's rabbit. You can't, can't have any rabbit. And I, I don't know that I've ever had rabbit, but I've heard people say that they like rabbit. And some of you are going, don't eat my bunny. I don't know. I come with God on that. And then verse number seven, and the pig, don't eat that because it's unclean to you. So don't eat pork. That, that, that even means uh, no bacon, no pork belly, no, you know, none of the good stuff. Don't, you can't eat any of that. Verse number eight, you shall not eat any of their flesh. You shall not touch their carcasses. They are unclean to you, okay? This is, this is God telling, telling the people that. There's a whole list of things that God's people are supposed to stay away from. Why? Well, if you go through chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16, chapter 17, chapter 18, it's not just foods. God's gonna tell them a whole bunch of different things that they're not supposed to do. And then in chapter 18, verse number 24, he says, here's why I'm telling you all of this. Verse number 24. He says, do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things. For all of these nations that I'm driving out before you have become unclean. You see, they were using all of these these animals, these meats, these different things as part of worship acts in bad ways. And so at this point in time, God's saying, there's been too much of that happening. And now now we're going to stay a long ways away from that. Verse 27, for the people of the land who were before you did all of these abominations so that the land itself has become unclean. Verse 30, so I'm telling you, you keep my charge. 
never to practice any of these abominable customs that were practiced before you and never to make yourselves unclean by them. Why? Because I am the Lord your God. And I'm telling you that you need to to live right before me. God has given the people of Israel this list of foods, of ceremonial practices, of types of worship that they are supposed to stay away from as they entered into the promised land. Why? Because there are nations in the promised land who have been engaged in pagan worship doing all these things that God is now commanding them not to do. Essentially, God is saying to them, you cannot go in and eat. You cannot go in and live. You cannot go in and look like the nations that are there now because you're not like them. Because you're not one of them. Something needs to distinguish you. Don't make yourselves unclean by all of these practices that they are practicing. And I wanna, I wanna pause there for just a minute today and say this. this. This is an aside from the story and aside from the point. You ready? In the society that we live in today, our society has many pagan practices. And there are far too many Christians today who say, ah, I just kind of want to do some of the practices. I, 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 I kind of want to follow God, but I want to allow some of these things that people do, some of what they look like, some of how, I kind of feel like that's something I want to do. God would say to you, we need to look different from those who are pagan. Can you understand what I'm saying? We are not to be like them. That's why Peter's perplexed. Peter's like, well, wait a minute. You're asking me to get up, kill, and eat, but the things that I'm supposed to eat are things that, that you said were unclean. This is different than the rules I grew up with. This, this, is, this doesn't make sense. I grew up in a house. I was taught our whole nation. We, we don't eat those things. Why, why are you telling me this? And it, it's not that God no longer wants his people to be distinct. He, he does. It's just that Jesus himself has already brought clarification and, and some change to their things. They, they have been long enough away from the people that had dwelled, dwelled in the land that, that there could be a separation then. And Jesus had come and brought new clarification to the rules because they're in a slightly different circumstance. Jesus does this in Mark chapter seven. So Mark chapter seven, verse number 18, Jesus says to them, then you are also without understanding. Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile them? Since it enters not into his heart, but is into his stomach, and then is expelled. Thus he declared, Jesus declared, all foods to be clean. Here's the point. When when the people of Israel were going into the promised land, it, it wasn't the things that people were eating that were defiling them. It was how they were eating those things and what was associated with it. It was where their heart was in relation to how they were eating it and how they were worshiping other things around that. And in that time, because it was so closely connected, God had said, don't eat any of these things because in this moment, it represents all these other things. Now the nation of Israel has been here for a long time and there's separation. And Jesus comes back and says, listen, Let me tell you the heart of all of this. It's not that the actual food was unclean. What was unclean about it is the way they were eating it and what they were making it. In reality, it's not what you eat that's unclean. It's where your heart is in all of this because your heart is is what what creates uh, the, 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 the distinctions here. Verse number 20, Jesus goes on. He says, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of, man, of a man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder. Talking about the last 24 hours of our nation. Adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All right, I'm going to do it. I didn't say this last service. I'm going to irritate some of you here. You ready? 
Anytime you have a month in the year that is called Pride Month, and you look at the Bible that specifically over and over again says pride is the downfall of people, does that tell you something? I'm just going to pause it for a second. I'm going to go on, all right? Verse 23, because, because at the same time, hear me, hear me, at the same time, at the same time, what we're going to get to here with people is that none of us are different. We are all far from God. So, so we're not looking better than or worse than. I'm just talking about the practices can be, but the people are all, are, are you far? All right, verse 23. All these things come from within, and they defile a person. Through this vision, God is saying to Peter, all these food laws aren't what distinguishes people anymore. Don't get stuck on the food laws and allow that to separate you. Instead, focus, focus on the fact, uh, focus on character and how that, and how that is different, and, and focus on the fact that all of, all, what, what he's going to say is, all, all people, don't allow people to be separated. Don't allow these, these lines to be drawn because the Jewish people had then taken that and said, now we can't spend time with people because they're, they're different than us. They're separate from us. They're outsiders. And Jesus is saying, Peter, I'm using the food to show you the, how, how we got this all wrong. And now there's gonna be three guys at the door and when they say, Peter, we're here, we want you to come back with us to the house of Cornelius, you're going to say in your mind, well, I can't go see Cornelius. He's an outsider. He's somebody I don't spend time with. Everybody knows it. I've got all these reasons why I can't go. God is calling us to take the message of the gospel, even to those who we don't see as worthy or like us. Amen. Number one. God is working in ways we cannot see to draw people to himself. Number two, he's not doing that on his own. He's also calling us to take the message of the gospel to those who we see as not worthy. Here's the final point of the lesson that I want you to get from these verses. Number three, receiving the message of the gospel is how people are brought into the kingdom. Amen. Receiving the message of the gospel is how people are drawn into the kingdom. Brought into the kingdom. Let me say it this way. You ready? We all have messages that we bring to people from time to time. We, we tell people stuff, right? Those of you who are parents, you're going to understand this really well. Because you have messages that you bring to your kids. And sometimes they don't receive your message. In fact, some of you have teenagers. And you have entered into the state that I call the tunnel state. There is a point in time where every teenager goes into what I call a tunnel. And in the tunnel, there is no reception. You cannot talk to them. You can talk at them, but they will not receive your message. And if you're a parent who's going through this for the first time, here's what I want to tell you. When they are in the tunnel, pray for them. They will eventually come out of the tunnel. Hopefully by 2022, some of you are going, I got, I'm 40 years old, they still haven't come out of the tunnel. Just pray for them, okay? The, but this is what I'm saying. You have, we have messages. Some, some of you are laughing because of your teenagers, but you talk to your spouse and they, they got messages they're trying to give you and you are not receiving the message. Hello? Here's what I'm saying. Receiving the message of the gospel is how people are brought into the kingdom. And when you bring a message to somebody in your life, all you can do is bring the message. You cannot force them to receive the message. Let me tie this all together. You ready? Believe it or not, God is at work doing things in the lives of people who are far from, far from him right now. He's at work doing things that you and I can't see. It's happening. You don't think it is, but it's happening. Secondarily, he has called us to bring the message of the gospel to them. But our primary reason why we don't do that is because we've manufactured all these reasons in our head of why they're not going to receive the message. We're afraid. And so we don't bring the message. 
You're not responsible for them receiving the message. You are responsible for bringing the message. And if you're a parent, please tell me you don't stop telling your teenagers things because you think they're not going to listen. You still got to tell them. For people who are far from God, they need us to bring the message of the gospel. It's not up to us for them to receive. That's between them and God. But God has called us to bring the message. Acts 10 verse 33. Peter, I sent for you at once when when the angel told me and you've you've been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, all of us, I, my friends and family, I texted them all. They're all here in the house. We are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have commanded by the Lord. And if you go and read the verses that follow, what you'll see is Peter talks to him about the gospel. And in the middle, in the middle of while he's still talking, they put their faith, all of them put their faith in Jesus Christ and God's spirit descends on them. And Peter says, let's baptize everybody because they've gotten saved. It's a Roman centurion. But God was at work. God called me and they received Here's here's the question today. In the plan of God that God is at work doing, would you play your part? Would you play your part? Because God is at the work in, in the life of somebody you know in ways you don't know. And God is calling you to go and tell them the story of Jesus or tell them the story of how Jesus has changed your life or invite them to a place like this where they can hear the, the, the story preached. God has called you to go into their life and you are the only one. You may be the only one in their life that can take the message because I don't know them. What would it look like if a group of people like this were to embrace the understanding that God is at work He has called us. And when the message of God goes forward, good news changes lives. Let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, one more time as we approach the end of one of our worship times, one more time I want to pause. And I want to thank you for your word that leads us and guides us into all truth. Would you help us today? Not just to be hearers of the word, but would you help us to figure out how to apply it in our own lives? Help us to see the people around us who are far from you. Help us to put our faith in you and your spirit working in us and through us so that we could find a way to present the gospel to them so that they might receive and in so doing change their lives for all eternity. We give you praise today. Amen. Amen. I want to ask you while you're standing here today with the message of the gospel, would you receive? Some of you, when you walked in here today, you've been feeling this the whole time. You feel like you're unwanted. You feel like you're unworthy. You feel like God would never accept you. You would never tell anybody that. No one else can see it from the outside looking in, but that's where you're at today. The Bible tells us that God loved you so much that he sent his son to this earth and he died on a cross because he loved you so much that he, was, he wanted to pay the price for your sins himself. And the day that Jesus stands and says, you are worthy because of me. I love you. And I offer you forgiveness from your sins, sins that today are separating you from God. Right now, where you're standing today, if that's you, I want to encourage you to pray a prayer to God. Just say, Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. I know I'm not worthy of you, but forgive me of of my sins. Make me a part of your family. Forgive me of my sins. (laughs) It's the first step in a grand journey of life. And if you'll If you'll pray that prayer authentically 
and then begin to follow him, he will do some unbelievably amazing things in your life here and now. He'll have a place for you for all eternity with him. We're gonna close our service by having a time of, of worship and prayer really quick here. I'm gonna invite some of our leaders that are here to come down to the front to be ready to pray with people. Some of our, some of our deacons, some of our elders that are here, they're gonna come. In just a moment, I'm gonna open the altars to pray. Our worship team is gonna lead us in one last song before we go. If you're here today and you prayed that prayer of salvation, that prayer for forgiveness, before you leave, I wanna encourage you, come down here to the front and just tell one of the leaders that's standing here. Let them pray with you, pray for you, encourage you in a couple ways. Don't leave this place without telling somebody you prayed that prayer today, all right? Do that for me. Secondarily, if you have a need that's in your life, maybe it's somebody you know that's far from God that needs God, come down here for a moment and pray for them. Pray that God would use you in their life. Maybe, maybe you're struggling with, with emotions, uh, struggling with your finances, struggling with your health, struggling with some family issues. Is there? You need God to touch you today. Before you leave, would you reach out to God in this way? Allow some of the leaders to pray with you, pray for you. Our worship team is going to lead us in this one last song. The altars are open for people to come. God bless you as you do. God bless you. Go in grace and peace. May the Lord go with you. Spirit.